Boom, 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 boom. Matty fucking bristle. <laughs> the knockoff is back. Brief hiatus is officially over. Knockoff <laughs> Nation. We're back. We're back. Episode 16 coming at you. We've got a uh, fresh bottle of Captain Morgan on the table. We're going to sit back, have a couple and throw down. Uh, Danny, he's back looking rested. Salud. A, uh, brief uh, trip to uh, the United States and Colombia, which we'll touch on in a minute. And uh, he's looking rested. He's back. Must have been a hell of a time. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's always good to get away. It's, um, yeah, just uh, a really good, like, uh, reflective time for me, man. I think, um, you know, it's easy to get burdened down with work and, and all that sort of stuff. And I feel like a lot of my holidays in the recent couple of years have been based around sort of people's weddings or, you know, other reasons for leave other than, you know, basically a selfish reason. So. Yep. For me, yeah, it was just a good a good time out and just cruise over there and ha- saw plenty of amazing stuff and, like, experienced a whole bunch of new things. And, yeah, it's just good to get away, you know. Like, and, But, I mean, it's always good to come home too, you know. Like, after after five weeks on the road and sleeping here and there, like, it was good to, to come back to my own bed last night, so. Definitely. Was it, uh, was it a culture shock going to country speaking Spanish, like ma- yeah, majority yeah. Spanish. Was there a, a lot of English speaking there or you had to really adapt to it? Uh, well, we like, uh, we stayed, I, I met a friend over there who's been living over there for a few months. And, shout um, out Veltri. Yeah, shout out Vinnie Mac. He's uh, he's doing his thing over there. He's um, he's basically a visual artist, but he's sort of looking to get into into tattooing specifically. So he's, he's kicking uh, some goals by the looks he's of it. Got too. A, yeah, he's got a machine over there, and uh, he he banged a couple of lines on my toe as well. So uh, so yeah, he pulls a straight line, and he and he's doing his thing. But uh, yeah, I mean, he's just he's just beginning out in that game. So um, it's a good little it's a good little artist town for that, you know. And uh, and tattoo equipment is cheap and. Nice. Food is cheap and it's it's cheap to live there. So, but uh, yeah, f- fucking huge culture shock, like mm. absolutely massive. Because it it's like uh, you know you really you really get reinforced that sense of other when you're the the total blue eyed blonde haired gringo in the mm. middle of you know you you stand out like fucking dogs balls <laughs> yeah. and you feel it too yeah. like you feel the eyes on you and especially where we, where we sort of stayed was um was not notoriously like a touristic area we were sort of more in a in a localized area and uh the first couple of weeks of staying in um in Medellin we actually realized that the uh the accommodation that we'd booked we had like an Airbnb with a couple of a couple of boys in it and um <coughs> didn't really do our research on the on the neighborhoods too much but everybody we would tell that we were living in Prado was like why did you why did you come to Prado like it's a, it's it's notoriously like a dangerous area so but there, there is that edge to the place still absolutely the the like probably the the most succinct way that I can that I can sum up Colombia is like it's beautiful and dangerous and it's it's always this mix of the two that you feel like no matter where you are there's you're surrounded by like all kinds of incredible beauty like the the city of Medellin itself is this um teeming sort of like DIY built city in the bottom of a valley that's that's even the valley is sort of 1800 meters above sea level or something like that so sort of as you leave the airport and start driving down the ridge into the into the valley the city of Medellin you sort of you see this just immensity of of it looks dense in the photographs that, that you have shown it's, it's really it, built up it just it's so much brick yeah. by the looks of it yeah. too it's a lot of brick accommodation like what uh, what was your gaff like that you'd rented uh like i mean when you get in the city and sort of the airbnb type places it's no real different to you know the sort of city city living over here but as you get sort of more out into the the sort of like sketchy barrios and stuff like that it is a lot of that red brick diy housing where you just sort of patch up your own walls and your own roofs and stuff like that and and people live with with little you know what i mean if you if you've been to south america it is you know you you do see that huge disparity between like socioeconomic levels of society and uh yeah all of that like you know 
the the varying degrees of when you fly into the the airport and there's these big sort of mansions like farm type mansions that are just on perfectly manicured lawns estates you drive a little further and then you sort of you start to see where people are living on top of each other and the streets are pretty mean like Mm. and uh you just it's just this yeah this concoction of the two where it's like you know this is this is insanely beautiful and such a such an incredible place in so many ways but you're acutely aware of the the danger that is inherent like Mm. in every step you make especially when you have that feeling of all eyes on you you know what i mean you're walking around you're the center of attention it's you know you come from a you know we're obviously like white anglo-saxon background and we live in the majority in our in our country that's like you know a a, a colonized british british colony or whatever good to go and uh, you don't you don't feel that sense of other you know the this the sort of other that you hear about from different sort of cultural groups in Australia and stuff like that it sort of it makes you feel that mm. like oh, especially definitely. and everybody's definitely. looking at you and then all of a sudden somebody's screaming yeah. gringo something and you know they're screaming at you yeah. and it's like oh shit like, yeah but that's a uh, that's a, just a way to grow as well too like you come back li- live through that sort of experience man it's great that you can sort of put yourself in those situations and come out. And learn a lot about it. Absolutely, about, yeah. about that part of the world, but also a lot about yourself too. Yeah, for sure. And like I, I remarked to somebody when I, because um, I came home via New York. I'd never been to the east coast of the states, so I spent like three nights in uh, Williams, Williamsburg, Brooklyn, which mm. was fucking amazing. I bet. And uh, um, like I just had this feeling, like when I arrived, that it was so fucking safe you know and new york city is a huge city that would have you know a pretty a pretty high homicide rate and all that sort of stuff but uh a a fun fact actually is that medellin is actually uh it has a higher homicide rate than new york city with a population about the size of brisbane so it's uh it's a it's around about two and a half three people a day get uh get murdered in in medellin so it's those realities that ring home but having that experience and having gone there and sort of felt that vibe on the streets and, and, you know, seen some of that shit Mm. coming to Brooklyn, it was like, this is so fucking safe. You know what I mean? Hello there. How are you, sir? (laughs) Yeah. Exactly. Welcome to the U S it's just sort of back to that English where, you know, whatever sort of goes down, you're going to be able to communicate with people there. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Most definitely. Back, um, back to the majority. Yeah. Uh, Exactly. Exactly. You know, it's that creature comfort of, of that. uh, You feel that again. That feels just sort of instinctual and primal though. That sort of like, I think that's just on a subconscious level sometimes yeah. just to get back to that. It's funny though when I got to Brooklyn I um I was watching uh Netflix and I watched this special of uh Michael Che, I think his name is. He's like a African American comedian and uh he's obviously from from New York and so he's the first bit like the first half of his show like he's doing this like these bits about New York City and stuff like that and he's talking about Brooklyn and he's saying like yo when I was a kid it was like you get killed if you go to Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> now all these white women move in, the rent goes up. You could gentrify a whole neighborhood. Like, oh. And that's basically what you feel when you walk around Brooklyn. It's all of these like boutique cafes and secondhand clothes stores and record stores. I fucking loved oh, it, man. man. Like, oh, absolutely, man. It's just a, the you can feel the the energy when you go to cities like that in that mass just so many totally. people and it's got a yeah. it's got an attitude to the streets at, yeah. at that sort of place yeah. too where they talk about new york as being abrupt and things like that i remember asked a lady uh for directions at the subway and was just sort of like you'll figure it out like fucking <laughs> not 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 sort of any any yeah. assistance like at all like oh shit but yeah, fair this, enough she's I got somewhere to be running her own race i had this feeling when i was walking around new york i was like and obviously you know, you're there for three nights. You definitely get the the straight tourist version of it. You're not sort of really getting under the skin of, you know, what's happening out in, in certain barriers month, and man. stuff. You need you, so fucking really long. Would. That place is so big. But it feels like when you're walking around, it's almost as if the whole place is a fucking, like, a movie, like a movie set that, that's happening. And, and, and all of this stuff is like a set, right? And all of these people are dressed in costume and everybody's kind of acting like it's real life, but it's really like this caricature of itself where it's just, it doesn't even seem real. You walk into the deli and it's just, it seems, I don't know. And I guess it probably, it's probably indicative of the perspective of somebody who's grown up in Southeast Queensland and 
been saturated their whole lives with you know media and hollywood and everything all of these different stories coming out of new york it's Mm -hmm. like you know the cultural epicenter of the world almost for somebody of a western background undoubtedly Mm -hmm. um and like and i guess to see it for the first time in real life it's just like well this is just a fucking movie yeah it is is, man yeah it's 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 bizarre yeah i was only um (laughs) young when i was there too i was sort of like 21 years old yeah Spent just sort of the best part of life. Hard dick, yeah. 21. Just fucking so tall. You know, like <laughs> <laughs> walking the street, just up in my belt. Like, oh, no. But we were there during uh, the summertime. So I was girlfriend. Sort of, no, it was sort of, yeah, it was sort of <laughs> su- summertime between. Um, wasn't quite. Oh, it was probably spring more than anything yeah. when we were there. So it wasn't uh, wasn't ridiculously cold by any stretch. It was just comfortable walking the streets and. Just to sort of see some of the, like, you go see the Times Square, Ground Zero. Um, went to a hockey game at Mad- Madison Square nice, Garden. Just sort of nice. like, cool bucket list shit, man, where yeah. I can say, oh, yeah, I've b- been there and done that sort of yeah. thing. So I'm a, and as you say, I had the appeal to go to, go to the States and obviously like, have, having lived overseas in North America as well, it just has that pull to it because we just raised by that shit out here, man. It was yeah. so far away and just drip-fed everything from the States. Yeah. And we just eat it up. Yeah. Like, Totally. Still do, bro. Yeah. <laughs> like, still do, man. <laughs> Absolutely, bro. Yeah, it's hilarious. Like, so so many times on the road, like people can't understand the Australian accent at all. So I just put on like my straight SoCal baby. Yeah, <laughs> like, yo, what's up? Yo, can I get a lighter, please? A what? Yo, can I get a lighter? Like, yeah. oh, a lighter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah dog. Here you go. <laughs> 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 you know I mean? Got a water, mate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no, it's funny then Like Australians get misinterpreted A whole bunch on the road Like whether it be The sense of humour Or the The accent Or like There's there's a, It takes a certain type of person And it's generally a person Who's had experience With Australians before To to like properly Sort of Get on our vibe And understand mm. us a little bit It's funny I was staying in this hostel In um, Santa Marta In the northern part of Colombia Which is like Uh basically where the Caribbean sort of heads towards uh, Central America and everything. So it's supposed to be, you know, where Colombians go to holiday. It's like one of the nicest places that you'll find. And um, this Canadian dude who was probably like, I don't know, mid-30s or something like that, was running this hostel there. He basically just put his money into it and he had a little bit of construction background and stuff like that. And and he was talking about like the different types of... uh, like nationalities or whatever that stay at the hostel and like, and what they're like. And he's like, yeah, Aussies are generally okay. Like, they never argue their bill. Like, you, you like the the next day when they're all hungover and you're like, yeah, you had forty one beers last night and they're like, oh, fuck, did I like yeah. that? They ne- nice boys. <laughs> yeah. He's like, they never they never argue. They never dispute it. Like, which is like obviously something that like a lot of other people do. Whereas it's just like we're known for that sort of like. Larrikin, heavy drinkers, Most just definitely. everywhere we go, a repu- reputation precedes us. Yep, on, everyone's just on holidays when they're over there. Aussies yeah. on vacay doing yeah. that. Gee, <laughs> well, it was <laughs> like at the same hostel, man. I um the first night I got there, this dude cruises in who's like, I don't know. Sometimes you see a white guy, you like this guy probably speaks English, but I don't know. Like, mm. and this is <laughs> this dude ended up being from Brisbane, and uh, and he cruises in with like long hair or whatever, and I was like. I was like, hey, buddy. Like, and then he's like, oh, hey, man. Like, noticed he had an Australian accent or whatever. Chatted to this dude for a little bit and he was just completely like space cadetted. And I was just like, fucking, is this guy like the full quid or whatever? He was sort of like vaguely describing that he worked there. And then, um, and then he's like, oh, man, sorry if I'm a little spacey, but like I, I literally like just got back from this like two-day festival and I'm just like – tripping out right now man (laughs) 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 and he like and apparently he worked there but you dead set just like he was a ghost you just see him every now and every now and then at the bar and you'd be like hey gary and then it'd just be like he's supposed to be working there but you don't see him for the rest of the fucking day and i basically just got the story that he had um he'd gone to columbia and then just uh basically ran out of money and kind of like maybe cooked <laughs> cooked himself a little oh, yeah. bit just fr- from the party Got carried and away. um and now just kind of like works enough to be able to be afforded a meal and a bed like at the hosp- hostel because basically they just have volunteers you know travelers yeah. come through and they're like yeah, i'll stay for a couple of months. i'll help out in the bar yeah. and you give me you give me shelter and, and something to eat and yeah. that, that's how it works sort of thing so um <laughs> yeah you sort of you get that 
that cool sort of <laughs> cool <yeah. tips. laughs> yeah, you get oh, that man. that Aussie that exists, you know, yeah. the guy that just just permanently lives at the hostel in Colombia. Right. Yeah. Like. His folks back here in Adelaide, <laughs> like, yeah. nah, he had a good, he's having a good time over there, like not knowing anywhere close to where he's yeah. at. Like, yeah. but we get a couple of strange texts every now and then. <laughs> like, uh-oh. There's a lot of expats over there, like mm. like the Canadian dude though, for example, who, you know. Fuck yeah, man! Do that shit. Like, go, go like invest your money, and he yeah. works hard. Like mm-hmm. he he said that they. How was it built? Was it sort of like half decent structurally and stuff? Oh well, I mean, yeah. Like yeah. once they were done, but there would have been absolutely fucking nothing there before. Mm-hmm. And he said he set it up with this local Colombian dude, so Mad. that it, he would like, um, because it's because it's very much about how you mesh in with the locals and stuff like that because in a lot of these places man in central and south america it's fucking the, not really the rule of law you know like and if you piss off some locals i, I when i was in Nic- nicaragua for a, for a month like a few years ago and met some canadian dudes as well who were running a bar and they used to get death threats like a couple of times a week from from locals seeing how much money these gringos were making in their city and shit like that and living in the nice house on the hill and stuff Ooh. And, um, you know, you, you like... End up getting fixed up if you're not careful. You cross the wrong person, mm. man. Somebody will just, like, you know, with with nothing to lose, will come in the night and fucking... Man, I bet you didn't mention uh, Pablo Escobar's name over there too much, or... Oh, I mean, it's... it's is, how was the the attitude towards that? Did you get that out of any of the locals that you met? Like, yeah. Plenty, man. Yeah. Like, there's, the, like, you know, uh, I guess, like a brief brief history of Colombia sort of thing like um I mean it's so it's so ingrained particularly in Medellin because Medellin was was Pablo Escobar's birthplace and and where he grew up and everything like that and even before Pablo Escobar's time for the last 52 years there's been something of like my sort of rudimentary understanding of it is like a civil war basically between the FARC and the government the FARC which uh yeah from from my understanding which is obviously pretty limited is like was basically like a farmers union back in the day that sort of um you know somehow turned it in turned itself into a conflict that's basically like a civil war between the government and this sort of um Dude. this this I think they're a right wing group um but but yeah and then so there's always been this sort of tension and accusations of government corruption and then that obviously created something of you know a vacuum for the narcos and the likes of Pablo Escobar to come in and and make all the money that they did and and you know all of the violence that that went on there um and I guess probably the the really sort of like hit home moment for me um because obviously like I don't know, anybody that I told I was going to Colombia, it was like the Western conception of it is like, oh, you're going to do bulk coke and, and oh, party yeah, yeah. and like that sort of thing. And it's, and it's really like the people there have suffered so much at the hands of those like drugs and all of that shit that it's it's not like a party place. It's not, you know, Cabo. It's not... No, yeah, it's, it's not uh, Ibiza. No, exactly. Not by any stretch. Yeah. yeah. People are still there in the hustle. Like, yeah. Not living on much. And, and, stuff, and you really get say. a vibe for you know, the the real sort of antithesis to the story that we've been fed as Westerners with Johnny Depp in Blow and, you know, these Netflix narco, na- narco yeah. special and shit like that where it's the good guys versus the bad guys. And, and Pablo Escobar in a lot of those is, is sort of like he, they make him out to be an anti-hero of sorts. And, and there was that element of, of sort of Robin Hood, like he would give back to, you know, like the local people and he wanted to liberate Colombia and all that sort of stuff. But ultimately it was it was self-interest for, for oh. Pablo Escobar. He saw a, a tumultuous political and, 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 you know, social situation and, and fucking made a crazy amount of money nah. through, through a crazy amount of violence. And, uh, and you can do stuff in Medellin like these Pablo Escobar tours that to me they just seemed like too yeah. touristy and tacky where you would go like visit his – I think it was like 50 US or something and it's like half a day experience or whatever. You go visit one of his mansions and then they like take you around to these different like spots that he was known for frequenting and stuff like that. Oh. And then you go play – I don't know whether it's at one of his mansions or just somewhere else, but you go play paintball like as if you're, you know, a bunch of narcos like shooting each other up and shit. And it's just like, for me, like, because I went, um, 
in my first week, I went to the Casa de Memoria, which is the, the House of Memories. And it's basically like a, a museum that's been dedicated solely to the narco drug war. Wow. And uh, a lot of it was in Spanish. So, I mean, there was a whole bunch that I didn't understand. But I love going to galleries and museums and shit like that. It's one of my favorite things to do. And um, they had like these big sort of interactive tablet type things. And like one, this was one of the things that was in English. And, um, and it was like... So, like, if you imagine, like, a, a sort of A3 iPad sort of thing in front of you. And um, Medellin is basically the capital city of the province or state or whatever of Antioquia, which is, like, the broader sort of no. part of um, Colombia that it sits in. And um, and so it was, like, a map of Antioquia. And then on the top, it had, like, different boxes. So you would have, like, from from left to right sort of thing, like, homicides, kidnappings, massacres like all of these different sort of things and then down the bottom was like a timeline that you could drag from say like 1979 all the way up to like 2013 and you would see the numbers on the map move so you could select like kidnappings and then there'd be this little like red circle of like okay there were four kidnappings here like and as you move the dial it's like these numbers like start to like move and change in front of you and then you see these big explosions of numbers like 2010 like all of these homicides in this one area or 2013 like heaps more kidnappings and all this sort of shit and you're like fucking hell like this is the extent of you know the violence that's going on in a place that's a similar population to brisbane city and it's just like you're trying to you're trying to compute that in your head and it's just like fuck these numbers are insane like surely you know everybody must have lost somebody in this in this drug war you must six degrees of separation you must have known somebody that's been gunned down or multiple you know multiple just pablo in his prime with the amount of law enforcement officers that he gunned down through his um toughs like his hired goons yeah. <laughs> or, um, hired go- goons. goons hired goons <laughs> goons <laughs> 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 I had goons. <laughs> Just adjust his tie. For all the Simpsons fans out there will know what we're talking about. But, um, man, um, awesome. but uh, yeah, and then so like at the end of this um, exhibit is basically like this, uh, it's like a two-story wall. So you're the, the piece of art or whatever you want to call it or the, the exhibit in the museum, um, you're standing at the bottom of it. It's like this two-story wall like going right up with all of these portraits that are probably like A3 or bigger of of somebody's face, like really sort of high-definition photography that's been taken and obviously of somebody that is either reliving or is in the grieving process of having lost somebody. So you sort of – you go from – this interactive tablet that's very sort of numbers orientated and you're like, fuck, these numbers are crazy, like all of this shit. And then you move to this thing that's that shows you the real human connection, which is this these giant faces like leading up this huge wall of just total grief and like despair and you just see Pe- that people see uh, witnessing you know, it like, family like, members a, like a mother's it. face who's lost you know three of her sons to to fucking gang Narca, violence yeah. or, or or whatever and like i'm getting chills like even, oh. even just sort of like talking about it because to look at that and you, and it's just like these these really high definition photographs it's just like it hits you in the chest where you like you really understand or not you don't understand whatsoever but you can put your start to try yeah. and empathize with what this fucking city has suffered over like such a long period mm-hmm. of time and it was actually like you know in the in the western media they made it out to be quite a significant thing while i was over there the farc and the government signed a 52 year peace deal and um and I actually heard about it through my family from back home because it wasn't being, like, publicised over there at all or anything. And, like, so, you know, CNN or whatever were reporting it on this big landmark thing, which, it, which I mean, it is. But um, everybody in Colombia, it's been such a rocky road to peace that it's just, like, the signing of a peace deal to them, it's, like, they meet it with scepticism way more than any kind of... Excuse me celebration or anything like that you know because it's just it's it's, tough it's such them, a hotbed you know? so they're cautious yeah exactly but you know the and to put it even in further perspective um you know i met some people over there from venezuela for example who had 
immigrated to Medellin because it was safer than Venezuela. Like they didn't, you know, they couldn't live in Caracas anymore because it was just so fucking like violent and scary. You hear a motorbike coming and they just, they run, they run to hide because it's like, that could be a fucking kidnapping. That could be anything like, Shit. and there's still crazy tourists, like crazy gringos that will go to places like Lots, Venezuela were there and stuff. A, what was the ratio of gringos? Did you see a lot of Anglo-Saxon peeps? Like, Yeah. Well, I think, um, like, like, As you do like, in every I was, place, like I was saying, we yeah. sort of we sort of targeted more to stay away from those places mm-hmm. initially in in um, in Medellin. But there was like uh, I think I did three sort of like little trips. So the first time I went out to Guatape, the second time I went out to Salento, and the third time out to Santa Marta. And all three of those places are sort of more um, natural environments, I guess. Like w- way less city, way more nature, animals, mountains, rivers, all that sort nice. of shit. And, uh, and every time you'd sort of do those more touristy things, all, all of the regular expats and all of the people from, you know, Europe and you'd meet other Aussies and stuff like that everywhere. But, um, yeah, for, for probably the, the vast majority, it was hanging around in, in local neighbourhoods and stuff like that and really sort of trying to, yeah, I guess, you know, get under the skin of it a little bit mm. and, um, and really sort of try to immerse myself in the language and stuff like that because that's the only really way that you learn a different language yeah for, so. and for the duration of your time that you spent there you can soak it up and you probably have progressed with your spanish as well if you want to hit us with something oh i mean like my my go-to line is always like me espanol is mal pero hablo un poquito which means like my spanish is bad but i speak a little bit nice. but uh more so now i'm sort of like uh entiendo poco pero uh hablas uh mm, is mal sort of thing like saying you know i can understand more than i can actually speak which i sort of that was the main thing that I took away from this trip was more sort of um, like I can listen to two people talking in Spanish now and through through a tip I got actually which was to not really try to focus on translating every single word that they're saying but just listen for the words that you do know and then try to get the gist of the conversation. So my um, – so Vinny who, who lives over there, like he grew up speaking Italian and, and sort of transitioned into Spanish and, you know, his, his family speak a lot of Spanish and stuff like that. So he, he's all over it these days living over there. And so, you know, for example – the the two of us in a taxi with him talking to the cab driver me sitting in the back i might not be able to pipe into the conversation but i know what they're talking about sort of thing so that's that's sort of like the progress that i made in in about four or five weeks there but um but yeah it's just six months you'd be a pretty confident street there basically yeah yeah you really really would the difficult part is is keeping it up once you get back to australia because Mm -hmm. there's not the necessity to speak it i mean even when you go to the states like there were several times in the states like in the four days that i came home where i was speaking spanish to people on the street or whatever like that because it's so fucking widespread there i mean they're attached to latin america so definitely in uh was there in the streets of la now since uh president trump was there cannabis everywhere in Los Angeles? Well, this is the funny thing. I've actually got <laughs> a funny story of my, like, last night in L.A. Because um, sort of on this trip, I guess, I used it as a bit of a, like, every time I would get to a new place, it would be my thing. Like, I'd go sort of for a walk around the streets and I'd sort of try and look for, like, a bit of a sketchy area. It's sort of gauge, okay, show me your sketchy stare. Yeah, like, oh, man, that's, so I can that's, <laughs> remember when me and you went to uh, down Hastings in yeah, uh, Vancouver? Exactly, that was, exactly. yeah. We just go, let's go see what's some edgy shit. Yeah, like. if you want to see some edgy shit, go to East East Hastings in uh, in yeah. Vancouver. They they Characters down argue there. with LA over who coined the term Skid Row, and it's, uh, <laughs> it's <laughs> quite a sight if you like to people watch. But I guess, I guess that's sort of part of it for me is like, you know, I like to see some of that authenticity you know like mm. some of that show me the, the real the shit real locals yeah, yeah yeah and uh and i guess like you know if if you know you <laughs> if you've bought a spliff off the street before you you can talk a little bit of a bit of the lingo with these guys and like just get a get a feel for it and so sort of on this trip every time i would get to a new place i would sort of go for a little walk and then and hit people up to see if they had some weed so when i got back to um when i got back to la I um it was a Sunday and Hermosa Beach is basically like a pretty decent little little Sunday sesh spot like just uh just south of Manhattan Beach so a little bit further nice. uh uh so- SoCal than um than like Santa Monica and Venice and stuff like that but um so yeah just did my usual sort of thing and just like cruising around just sort of 
trying to suss out like, okay, well, like show me some of your characters like and found a few sort of old dudes who look like they've been drinking all day and stuff like that and then had a chat to them. They they were like, oh, I can maybe get you maybe like come down here later on like the reggae club starts up at 8 p.m. and like I'll have some spliff then sort of thing like and um, and then so like uh, I ended up like not, not having any luck in the afternoon, well, up until the point and then uh, – I like see this guy sitting on the on the bench and he's like um, wearing it's football Sunday obviously oh, so yeah. he's wearing his full like New England Patriots get up and stuff Pats like that. In, in, and, rocking um, it out there. Was it Pats? Or well, LA Rams? No, no, no. He was from Boston. He no, was oh, from yeah, Boston. Was Pats then. Yeah, New yeah. England Patriots. <laughs> <or something. Yeah. laughs> like yeah. and proper Boston, this dude, man. Yeah. Like proper character, eh? Like one of the one of the like, you know, weirdest, yeah. weirdest dudes I've ever met in my life, man, almost. Like and uh, and so I pull up to this guy on, on my um, on my mountain bike, and uh, and I'm like, hey, bud, like you you know where I could um, I could score a, a little bit of weed around here, like. And he's like, oh man, I wish I could do a Boston accent because yeah. I would. Uh, this story would be. It's not better. fucking hard. <laughs> it's not fucking hard to get weed. Is <laughs> uh, <laughs> that full Irish? And, uh, <laughs> oh, he was he was <laughs> yeah. proper man, eh? Like proper. And uh, and so he's like, um, and he's like, no, but if you got if you got a lighter, like fucking, you can we can smoke a bowl, like. And I'm like, what, right here on the beach, like. And he's like, yeah, yeah, whatever, like, just fucking, Matt. like, we'll be sweet. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, just, cool, just, cool. Uh, That's the vibe around here, like, let's let's do it then, like. And the and the two old guys that I spoke to before, I was like, oh, it seems like it's a bit dry around here. He's like, man, it is not dry around. Here. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> he's just saying you got to know. But yeah. they were saying like, since it's been legalized, it's like. There's there's no illegal shit anymore. Yeah, you know? everybody just has a card and they go to the store to yeah, get it. So if if you're thing. if you're the Aussie like trying trying to buy it allegedly mm. uh, illegally on the street, then like you know it's uh it's actually harder. But this guy was good enough, so I went I went to the, like the corner store grab grab a lighter, and when I get back, he's on the phone and uh, and he's he's packing up this sort of like a uh, glass bubbler like uh, pipe pipe slash slash bong yeah. thing or whatever and uh and he hands it to me like while he's on the phone but he's he's speaking full lingo and then he's like yo yo he holds the phone back and he's like I'm speaking to my boy in jail i'm speaking to my boy in jail like and he starts talking and he's giving this guy a huge serve about you can't do drugs man you can't do drugs i'm telling him i can't do drugs and he's like <laughs> holding the phone back like while he's talking to me and doing this full thing and um and then so i'm like this guy's a bit of a character and he gets yeah. off the phone in the end and we start having a chat about like uh, I'm telling him about the recent spate of shark attacks and stuff like that, and he's like, <laughs> I told him, um, I told him about this like how they have a PTS group, PTSD group for for like uh, rescue survivors and stuff like that now, and he's like, no, no, like doing these big walks around the beach, like <laughs> I told you not to, you can, you can't say that, like in front of all these people, like just. So American and so like oh, out there, and I'm like, yep. fuck it, whatever. Like you got to roll with it, man. I've yeah, always had yeah. a uh, a decent rapport with Americans, man. I've met Americans all across, whether okay, it, whether yeah. whether it's been work or and stuff. Yeah. I've always always find a way to get on with Americans because they are uh, they are characters and, and big personalities yeah. and are uh, opinionated. And man. so I go to this guy. I'm like, uh, I'm like, um, fucking, I'm like, man, I'm thirsty as fuck. Like, where let's let's go get a beer, eh? Like, and he's like, yeah, man, like. And we start. He starts telling just me, "Just let like, me suck your dick first. Like, <laughs> <laughs> he offers to blow you and shit. Like, oh, just man. in his full New, New England <laughs> Patriots gear." And uh, uh, and then so he's like, he starts telling me, "Well, he's got like my boys up here. Like they've got this place, and it overlooks the whole looks uh, overlooks Manhattan and Hermosa and everything. And six sunsets from up there. Like we'll go up there. Like they'll hook us up and all this sort of stuff. And so we go up to this uh, to this bar where it's like a uh, a brew pub sort of thing but yeah. i have one look at the drinks menu and it's like 14 bucks for a vodka and like 10 bucks for these craft beers and i'm like oh fuck all right and he's like no no no, it's cool bro it's cool like these are my boys these are my boys and every person that we met that worked there like wasn't receiving this dude like he was their boy eh? yeah, it was yeah. like he was the fucking bar fly that <laughs> these guys didn't want a thing to do with this dude's back oh yeah <laughs> exactly. the dude in the brady jersey and they, back. Were, they was were already, it a brady jersey yeah 12 yeah, he was yeah, all about yeah. tom brady yeah of course and uh <laughs> <laughs> 
Go Tom. Oh, I love Tom. <laughs> and, um, Rightly and so. He was already in the shits with him because he hadn't paid his bill from earlier in the day. They called him when oh. we were down at the beach, <laughs> and they're like, "You got to come back and pay your tab or whatever." And so we rock these in. These my there. boys. These yeah. my boys. Like, <laughs> exactly. Hey, need you to pay his bill. And um, and so this fucking they pour me this fucking craft beer that is legit the worst beer I've ever had in my fucking Ooh. life, bro. Like I'm anybody who knows me, I'm not the the biggest fan of craft beers, but I'll drink like a summer ale or an IPA or something yeah. like that. And it's a, it's if fine. you have to. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'll I'll it. drink it and enjoy it. But um this was like I don't know whether it was extra crafty or whether it just wasn't brewed well, but it tastes like it was hard to get down, like one schooner of beer. Ooh. Until the guy's like, How'd you like that beer? And I was like, Yeah, yeah, man. Um I'll, I'll I'll grab a vodka though for the next one. Yeah, like. yeah. <laughs> yeah if, if there's any sort of lager there, just holler. <laughs> yeah, no lagers, no. no lagers. This was like a summer ale, but it was like it was fucking disgusting. For all the beer drinkers out there too, the summer ale John Boston available from Dan Murphy's for nineteen fifty fifty a six pack. Drank uh, eighteen of them on over the weekend, like Friday, Saturday, Sunday, <laughs> like six year thing. Like w- went away for the re- for the weekend, so nice. was able to get on the source. Yeah, and only three si- like three six packs. So I wasn't drunk either time, but yeah. just managed to drink a bit of volume that over the three days. But um, really, really good. Eh? We had nice. only w- one point one standard as well. So one more than a mango, yeah. forex gold for all those fucking New South pussies Wales. out there <laughs> <laughs> coming from the New South yeah. Wales. Man. Oh yeah, but mate, <laughs> f- firmly implanted up here though. Don't get me wrong. But yeah, like, but um, so this only di- a blues fan at. Origin time, man. So this fucking dude, man, like I'm sitting in this bar and I'm feeling kind of awkward because he just keeps introducing me as his boy and like, and then he's like, I can tell that all these dudes are off him big time. So I'm like, I'm like, bro, the vibe here kind of fucking sucks, man. Like, is there somewhere we can play some pool? Because like in uh, Colombia, me and Vinny played pool almost every fucking day, man. Like I, I'm not the best pool player, but I'm the best I've ever been in my life like at the moment. It's big there. There was fucking a culture huge, for man. it. There's like a, a, a B. Bijares, which is like billiards, yeah. um, hall on every fucking corner almost. Like wherever you go, there's yeah. multiple pool halls. Like a pub in Brisbane, there's a pub on lots of corners over here. Or over there, it'd be just pool hall. Fucking. Yeah, where you can get beers yeah. and like <laughs> what all of the local dudes are hanging out with like the girlfriend experience chicks at the front. Oh, and shit, like a full a gentleman's club. Where there's your fucking <laughs> urinal on the wall just in the exactly, middle of the thing. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Danny it's sent like us a Snapchat <laughs> while he's over there. I pissed like. Fucking, jeez, I cracked up when you said this. That <laughs> it was a pool hall and no men's room. There was just two urinals mounted no, on the walls there. No, well, there's no bathroom. It's a gentle, It's a legit gentleman's club. So you walk in the front and there's a bar to your left, and then there's a group of seats that'll like look at to, at like some soccer games or whatever. And and generally, like especially in Medellin City, there's a whole bunch of like what look like hookers, but they're basically like these girlfriend experience type. 20 year old girls that'll go hang in this little front bar area and they'll be super affectionate with the men and the men buy them drinks and give them tips and and shit like that and then you sort of you walk through that little freak show and then there's just like probably 10 um billiards tables and then usually sort of like two gringo pool tables at the back which the locals don't want anything to do with so it's perfect they're all playing this weird three ball game where it's like no pockets on the table and you've got to hit every ball like every one of the three balls with your shot. So it's this really sort of strategic like yeah. game of angles Trying and shit. Trying to snooker people hard. Yeah. yeah. And um, so we would just cruise it back to the to the billiard spot every time. But um, yeah, because it's like totally a place for dudes, there's no toilet per se. There's just literally a urinal on the wall at the back where you just sort of like have like half a saloon door that covers your dick while you take a piss out the back. It's... <laughs> it's Colombia in a lot of ways is still very much a uh, a patriarchal society, and uh, you'll see a lot of old dudes walk down the street, and they'll see a young, good-looking girl, and they'll, well, hey, darling, and shit like that. It's very much like, you know, that that sort of gender equity <laughs> hasn't quite caught up in Latin America so much, yep. you know. And I bet you do see uh, some incredibly beautiful women. Uh, bouncing around over Stunning. there. Stunning. Like lat- Latin women are like um, amazingly beautiful and um I mean <laughs> the 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 rumors about the the ass on like Latin women is is more than true and and I think you know it it's even crazier because 
cosmetic surgery over there is so rife and so cheap and so prevalent that um, you really <laughs> some so, like I mean they've all obviously genetically got really big booties. Mm. But um, but there's definitely a lot of fake booties out they there too. That there's enhancement either, there's yeah. uh, there's like you know after after probably about two weeks of walking around, you sort of like coming from Australia. Like I guess the you know the genetic type of Australian girls is fairly sort of straight up and down. Like in comparison to Latin oh. women, anyway. It is, and that, uh, that's not. Uh, wh- I don't know. Aussie it's, it's girls, we ain't mad at you. It's we're, just, yeah, we're, yeah. We're, it's just genetics. You're it, born yeah, that I way. Know, it's like, it's like anything. You can't totally like stereotype. Not every single Colombian girl has a giant ass, but no. if you were to properly do some measurements and some t- scientific testing on Latin America versus the Western world, it's not like it's not like a any kind of derogatory stereotype we're making. It's it's a statistical fact. Yep. Like that, <laughs> there are some. Some big seats over there. And I ain't mad at you, Colombia. I ain't mad at you at all. It was uh, an amazing experience. God, yeah. <laughs> Hats off, Colombia, all you beautiful, beautiful women. But, yeah, it's it's funny, though, like um, watching watching some of the boys, like, try and, try and, like, tune girls in Spanish and stuff like that. And a lot of the time you just, like, if you don't speak the language, you don't stand a chance. If, you're, if your pickup line is, is do you speak English in Spanish, you yeah. might just have somebody walk the fuck away from you. No, uh, a couple of, uh, <laughs> couple of guys that uh, went on to uh, Argentina. On, uh, yeah. on a trip to See, uh, Argentina, like Baja Blanca. Argentina, you series. could pass like for an Argentinian if you spoke good enough Spanish mm. because that's sort of almost like the the white country a little yeah. bit. Like we had some people call us Argentinian a couple of times really? walking around. Nice. Um, look at Lionel Messi, like the superstar from there, the ba- Barcelona football superstar. Yeah. He, he could pass as an Aussie if yeah. you're walking down the street here. Yeah. Yeah, so that, that's a that's a valid point. But these guys were had no Spanish in them at all. They're on a football tour, just walking around, walking up to chicks like <laughs> "Señorita Boom Boom," like <laughs> just trying to like like thrusting at them and stuff, <laughs> expecting to get there. So I, I don't think these guys did uh, did too well there, unless they uh, shelled out a few pesos <laughs> <laughs> allegedly. Like if you get what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. You're picking up what I'm throwing down. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there's there's definitely no shortage of that as well. There's like the streets are pretty rife with with sex workers giving you like proper eyes, and they they see a gringo and they call out from across the street, you know, like people who are just like got their Hollering, shit out yeah. big time, you know, and they have these little like um, these little sex hotels that you can pay for, like they they hand out flyers for them all the time, and you can pay like to go for three hours and there's all these like apparently anyway <laughs> there's all these like <laughs> <laughs> crazy like spas and shit like that so in someone there. told me <laughs> but um but honestly like you don't you know uh, i don't know I like, like i guess it's gonna walk in with a pistol 100 you know it's it's I mean? like when ah. you're walking through those areas and they and they're handing you those flyers and the, and the hookers are giving you the looks and and calling out to you and shit you feel vulnerable right. as fuck oh it's, sure i'll come in yeah I'll, I'll you don't you it, don't man. feel like oh yeah yeah, I'm horny. You feel yeah. like, oh shit, I'm watching my back. Where's yeah, like, you know, yeah. where's the rest of these people? It. And it's it's always in the sketchy areas. Like, so I mean, yeah. I can uh, comparatively to any sort of place that I've been, which sounds the equivalent to somewhere like this, is probably only Thailand. Yeah. Too, in terms of, like the sex workers and language yeah. barrier there, with people trying to sort of get at you to get your money. There's a bit. Of, there's ex- there can be cases of extortion there and things yeah. like that too. But also really beautiful. Yeah, it really is, man. Good place, good people you yeah. meet, and we say that you know it's dangerous and things like that. But there's encounters that you'll have with people in these countries too, where it's just it's friendship and the, yeah. there's warmth to like the relationship and the people. Absolutely, but, yeah. um, there's that edge to it too. Totally, and I think like uh, it was funny. My my dad picked me up from the airport, and and you know he said it, and it's and it's totally true is that uh, it, it is an amazing experience to go to these places and to be able to witness it and, and, and see how people live and, and sort of witness it. But it's great to be able to come back to, to a place that, you know, you, you, you gain this new appreciation for where you come from mm-hmm. and you gain an appreciation for, 
you know, fucking the majority of people in Australia probably don't even lock their front doors or they leave their cars unlocked or, you know, it's if if there's an antithesis to, you know, a dangerous place in the world, we live in it, man. And just, uh, Oh, just walking the streets at night comfortably. Like, yeah. Oh, I'm going to go yeah. out now. I'm not going to get fucking yeah. jumped. No, it's exactly. Not, it's not going to happen. Yeah. Like, You'd but, be desperately um, unlucky for things like that to happen in Brisbane, just wrong place, wrong time at this And that's point, the thing. And, like, you know, that's what, what, what I found hard to gauge as well, excuse me, was, um, like, you know, the, cr- the crime that exists in Australia, like, a lot of people actually, when I was travelling on this trip, were would, would ask me about the bikies and shit, and they'd be like, uh, uh, like, the bikies in, on the Gold Coast still, like, shooting up clubs and all that sort of stuff. And it's like, yeah, but, I mean, unless you're involved in that, world in australia it's not like we know of heaps of people that have had bikies just crash in on their homes when they've just been you know cooking dinner with their girlfriend and before they go to work the next day you know what i mean unless you're involved in that life in some way shape or form that sort of trouble doesn't really find you and that's that's what i would sort of wonder is it like you know is it only the people that are involved in drugs and sex and all this sort of shit over here that are that are, you know, making up this homicide rate or is it just totally innocent bystanders? And I think, you know, the vibe that I got was that back in the day there might have been more sort of reason to extort tourists for for different things. Like you see a tourist with a backpack, just jack him, take that shit, there's probably going to be, be a camera in there or something like that. But, like, because the statistic I read just before I went over actually was that um, three like expat um i think it was an american dude and two british guys in separate instances had been had been gunned down in poblado which is like the main sort of gringo hangout area of um medellin and it's supposed to be like safe and so um the the mayor or whatever of medellin came out afterwards and said you know while this is a massive tragedy it must be said that anybody that comes to medellin for the purposes of sex or drugs you know it, it can't be condoned here and, and and basically said that you know like gave a reason as to why you know these gringos were, yeah, were they killed got, they were some sinister shit going on they were hanging around somewhere they shouldn't have been late at night and fucking you know yep. tangling over money with the wrong people or, or whatever yeah. it may have been you know and and if slept you slept with some girls not paying the freight or things, yeah, things like that if you stay like clear clear of that sort of shit like and you keep your wits about you that you know, you can you can experience the beauty of a place like that. You know, that's awesome. That's awesome. Did you uh, might want to take a little? Uh, my Captain Morgan's empty here. We might fucking take one second, top yep. up some shit. We'll come back and uh, might start hitting some mixed martial arts. Yeah, baby. So we were going to come back to uh, mixed martial arts, but during the break, uh, Bryce was just telling me that he's uh, currently reading Carl Sandalance's autobiography. Yeah, so I just wanted to hear he thoughts on that. Oh, is that the actual title? It is Scandalance. Yeah, he's That's been, been awful. It, not uh, not scared of a scandal, <laughs> old fucking Scandalance. Sc- Fuck. Did Scandalance. his publishers convince him of that or yeah. what? Probably did it. Probably did it off his own bat, to be truthful. You reckon but he came up yeah, with it himself? Probably. That's but, so bad. But um, Scandalance. I'm only 100, 120 pages in so far, but he's a he's a Brisbane boy. He, is he? Gr- grew up is over he? at Carina and okay. Wynnum was where he spent time. But okay. threw a big house party in at uh, as as a teenager and got kicked out of home. But we both grew up in Brisbane in the 90s. And uh, do you remember the B105 Black Thunders? Yes, that was, that was like a, a car that would drive around mm. handing out free shit or like something. A fucking was it? Nissan Patrol or something like that. Two Nissan Patrols driving around with like a full radio decked out, and it had a radio presenter called Jamie Dunn. And uh, Jamie Dunn was Sandland's hero. Like he listened to listened to B105 constantly, just loved how it got down, loved the presentation of it, it just what made him tick. And uh, ended up moving up to Townsville and he was that obsessed back then. This is pre-podcasting obviously, but this is what podcasting is now. He'd get his friends to record it on a cassette tape and post them to Townsville. So he's listening to five-day-old B105. Like, Fuck. That dedicated to Fuck. listening to Jamie Dunn morning show and stuff like that. But it, that, And that's how he got his shit down. Uh. But uh, he said with the Black Thunders, though, he was unemployed in Brisbane just to fucking um, basically a drop kick. He's there. <laughs> like, his, yes, his, like his words too, drop man. Like drug addict. His words, man. Like <laughs> fucking just chilling, not much going on at all. And he goes... Uh, He'd listen, be listening to B105 live in his car and he'd find out where the Black Thunders are and just gun it there. Like, up fucking speed, break all the rules, get there in 20 minutes. And there was a Black Thunder driver named Spidey. 
So fucking he'd rock up. Hey, Spidey. Fuck, hey, man. He's like, fuck, you got here quick this time, mate. Like, <laughs> like and he's like. Proper known. Yeah, exactly, man. Yeah. Like, oh, fuck, he's back again. Yeah. He's here for the chocolate milk and the sticker. Like, <laughs> fuck, that's all they're giving away at this sort of shit, man. Yeah. It's not like really yeah. a big deal, but he's just soaking up the atmosphere and it end up getting a radio job in promotions and things like that. Kyle did, but uh, he goes, you might recognise uh, Spidey. He goes, he only, uh, I only found out years later that. He, he thought I was an absolute fucking pest <laughs> because I caught up with him years later. You might recognise him. His name's Osher Gunsberg. Oh, you're joking. <laughs> Host of the Bachelor, <laughs> the Bachelor and Bachelorette in Australia, like Australian <laughs> Idol guy. He was a radio marketing guy. And he's yeah. like, even Cole says, he goes, small world, huh? I was like, Yeah, well, I guess me. there you go, man. Because, like, you know, really there's a handful of celebrities across, you know, less than a handful of channels when it comes to free-to-air TV in Australia. So Definitely. Once would, you're in, you're in. That man. would be like a small world for sure. That would be everybody knows everybody, six degrees yep. of separation. You've had some dealings with that person. Yep. I bet but, Osher Gunsberg would, would be able to tell you some stories about Carl Sandlands and probably probably other motherfuckers. 100% so. they could, mate. At all these sort of like after ARIA parties with all the celebs in Australia – Getting amongst all sorts of gnarly shit, yeah. which they would be. Yeah. They're only yeah. human. These people, like that's it. Jeff we- Hugel <laughs> at the races at Ramwick just got caught with a bag of cocaine like yeah. a couple of years ago. These are, like, you just Andrew look, John's Grant mad Hack- Monday Grant, yeah. busting in on Daniel Johns. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, exactly. That's how small Australian entertainment and yeah. celebrity is. Grant like, Hackett, yeah. <laughs> another dude who's been uh, had his moments with. Um, Substance, yeah, yeah, it's pretty widespread out in this bitch. <laughs> <laughs> Benny Cousins, <laughs> yeah, look, at, yeah, he, he's another. He's only been in sort of trouble again recently, Ben. I, I really wish has he. And I was a huge Ben Cousins fan, I, and still, am, still am because recently, what, what, as what in he did like while I've been away, or uh, yes, okay. yes, yeah, okay, he's only uh, just had a couple of uh, indiscretions with <laughs> getting a, getting arrested again, uh, out, okay. out doing the wrong shit, basically, man. Drugs and sex, or yeah, I uh, just. Still be back on the drugs. Did you ever see the documentary on Ben? I Cousins? did, man. I did, it and it gave me, it was powerful. It gave me a um, a different perspective on him as a him as a person because he was obviously, you know, he's obviously been that guy since he was mm. since he came into his personality. You know, he's yep. obviously got a, a penchant or whatever you want to call it for that party boy lifestyle. Yep, and, and uh, uh, a, a super some, freak athlete at the same time, and exactly. it sort of went hand in hand with it, and. Now that the football's not and there. And that's not a, that's not a uh, that's not a unique story either. No, no, there's a lot of people caught up in that, man. I recently watched there's a golfer who fucking strung a couple of wins together back in the nineties, John Daly, who's one of the loosest men out there. He's lost over eighty million to gambling and Yeah, yeah. C- complete uh, drug addict, alcoholic, th- things like that that he's yeah. got stuck into. But I was watching a documentary on him the other day and they talked about it. He got inspiration to get off the alcohol while talking to this um Ex Pittsburgh Steelers quarterback Harrison, like from some okay. dude from the seventies, okay. and he goes, "Yo, everyone's talking about ISIS and all this bad shit, but <laughs> like this old old dude in his fifties, like everyone's talking about all, all this good bad quotes. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. He's, he's talking like, about ISIS. He but goes, everyone's <laughs> talking about all this o- ISIS and bad shit, but what would happen if old uh, Harrison started drinking beer and smoking crack again?" Like you know I mean? Talking to about, yeah, himself about himself in the third yeah, person. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. So you tell, telling him to clean up off substance. Like, <laughs> yeah, we've gone down a fucking weird path. <laughs> <laughs> did you see? Um, or did you he- hear rather uh, the uh, the John Jones interview with Joe Joe Rogan and all that? Uh, the dick pills, uh, the dick pills the, the alibi for the uh, for the for the steroids yeah. test. I, I don't know what to make of John. Like I've, I see him. I know as I know. like the as the young millionaire and things I don't like know. that. But this is this is my like interpretation of it. I didn't listen to the full interview, and I got nothing but absolute love for John Jones. One of like, you know, easily one of my top three favorite fighters of all time. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a new school fan, so John Jones, like you know, he, his rise for me was like me getting into the UFC. So I fucking love that and dude. You, you happen to witness probably the greatest. Rise ever, yeah. Arguably, that's been in terms of look, so the names far, that yeah. he's beaten, yeah. It, John is the shit. Amazing, like that that wow factor, or that you know the the pizzazz that you want to see and in entertainment Innovation. value of a big yeah. card. Like he provided that in spades, and um, and absolutely nothing but love. But when I listened to that interview and like you know previous interviews and stuff like that, 
and he even said it himself in the Joe Rogan interview, is that I feel like John Jones doesn't really know himself, you know. He's mm. he's still a fucking a 28-year-old dude, same as us, trying to figure his shit out, doesn't, you know, and on top of that, he's been thrust into this, you know, superstardom, sports star lifestyle that doesn't necessarily, like, well, it will 100%, it doesn't actually define you as a person because you that that's something that you do, but you're, you know, your own person separate aside to that. And and he's got obviously a lot of crazy natural ability uh, that that's served, served him so well because to hear him talk about his training and the sort of like different deviations that his training has taken and not necessarily... He's talking about not me, sparring anymore, things the, like that, talking about good, not getting yeah. hit. So yeah. he's all for... He said he's been doing a lot of jiu-jitsu. Like John... For me, I feel that, and obviously just pure speculation here, not knowing him personally at all, but some of his answers to me and just being able to judge body language and how people are talking, he seems to sometimes, for me, be answering questions how people, how he thinks people will want to hear him. Yeah. But I think he might go backstage to his mates and his brother and just be like a larrikin and quite someone who's just a fucking boss. Like he was yeah. talking about going to a bar, buying people 40 exactly. shots of Patron. Like exactly. He goes, I was really good at bringing groups of people together. Totally. And why wouldn't he be? Because he's fucking uh, the baddest man on the planet. 100%. They're just buying beers for everyone. And you, like, know come when, get some. you know when you see like embedded, even, even ones that like aren't about a card that he's on, it might be one about like, you know, fucking Holly Holm and the Jackson's gym. And you see John Jones when he's playing around with people and when he's being himself, he's this like larger than life, overconfident larrikin and, and, and got, but I think when you try and put him in that situation where it's like, let's sit down and talk yeah. what's hey, happening with you, John. How are like, you, John? You know, tell me your yeah. deepest, deepest, darkest thoughts and yeah. stuff like that. I don't think he's that sort of guy. Mm. So he's trying to be that sort of guy, whether it's through religion and all this sort of stuff, but, you hear him when he's talking about at the beginning of that interview when he's talking about how him and his wife really want to have a son like mm. they've had three or four girls already and about the gender reassignment yeah not, yeah the um he wants to have gender a boy. selection yeah yeah, yeah. and um and he's assignment and <laughs> <laughs> he just he just, just stitches one of his uh yeah. one of his daughters up like yeah. now we'll make you my son yeah that's it. here we go now <laughs> yep yep but um but yeah <laughs> Here's the testosterone. Well, here's Jones. a tainted dick pill. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, like <laughs> talk about weird paths. <laughs> <laughs> For all that they don't don't know what they're talking about, but pre UFC two hundred five in fight week leading up to uh, oh no UFC two hundred. Sorry, it was the um, huge celebratory card that they'd had lined up, and uh, John had to pull out in fight week because he'd failed a drug test. And what something that had come up was uh, some sort of peptide that was that he alleged that was in a tainted Cialis, like a dick pill. Yeah, like a, a male enhancement. A male enhancement. Correction that, pill. That's yeah. right, yeah. So he was he, he had taken that. USADA had come to test him. There was a, a trace of something in there. And you don't know if that trace w- potentially could have been something in a legitimate performance enhancer as well that happens to be in this yeah. tainted supplement. So you don't know if they take that path or not. Because we've seen a few fighters now, and Anderson Silva, Yoel Romero, now John Jones... I've all taken the tainted Cialis. So if these people got smart chemists behind them who can look at the ingredients in both of these things yeah. and say we could take this path. And let's and let's be real. So like you're you're John Jones, right? You're the light heavyweight champion of the world. You've just had your title stripped and this is your comeback fight, your chance at glory, all of that stuff. You've just witnessed fucking Anderson Silva be suspended for two years for a dick pill. Mm. Like you're just gonna get a dick pill of some guy that you met at the gym or whoever it was that happened to be a pharmacist and was like, "Hey man, I got this Cialis," and you'd be like, "Yeah, yeah, sure." And then and then when you start to rock up the next day, you're just totally confident. Mm. It's like, come on, man! Like, are you telling me with all the stories that you hear out here through NRL, uh, like the footballing codes out here with people taking? Still knocks and Red Bull and like remember when the like the rug, couple of rugby league guys yeah, and it absolutely. was alleged that they did that, it was that that sort of thing. You're telling me that a team doctor for these guys isn't going to be able to write them up for something like as simple as a Cialis or a Viagra if he's John fucking Jones? Exactly, exactly. The, where there's smoke, there's fire for me, and that's yeah. what I'm talking about with people sa- like alleging that he's t- just towing the company line a little bit with his answers. So yeah, yeah. I don't know, but, I, but as I, you say, I, I in terms of fight, fighting ability. A th- 
an absolute freak. And the thing that stood out with for me during that podcast with him, and, I, and I've been been a fan of Jones. I'm critical for when he does bad shit. Like in terms of that car accident with him crashing into a car with a with a pregnant lady in it, coming back to get his weed pipe and then just running off again. It's sort of like yeah, well that, oh, come that's on, man. that's you interesting to... when they question him when Definitely. Joe Rogan questions him about that because he's saying you know. I had no idea who was in the car and whether it was a pregnant woman and yeah, and yeah. whether it was even a woman and that sort of stuff. But come on, dude! At the end of the day, you didn't you didn't check the car yeah, on, like another, on another human. It's another yeah. human being, mm. man. And and like I I would have liked him to have said and been completely upfront and honest. And it's obviously indicative of the fact that he's not there in his own head yet. Is that admit that that decision was based out of self interest? It mm. was it was solely based out of. I was thinking about myself. I wasn't thinking. I was thinking about myself more than I was thinking about that other person. I was mm. thinking about my reputation Just as a own fighter, that, own that a, bit, as yeah. whatever. That's that's what I did. That's what I did as a human being. We're all capable of it. We're all capable of self-interest in you know our ego trying to protect our organism and all that sort of stuff. But um, I I feel like you know he would be this fucking unbelievably like sick character to have around like if you were if you were at a bar and John Jones was there and all that stuff that he's saying about you know if I'm there it's more likely that you're gonna get laid like fucking yeah, yeah. shit like that it's, like I'm I mean gonna, it's, it you? sounds Imagine. it sounds verbose and arrogant but but it's, it's fucking straight up it. true even straight he said that he goes true. it is it's true it's true and. Can you imagine if you you and I are drinking at a bar in America? If I'm on your uh, side by side with you in California, like you were recently, we walk into a bar and John Jones hands us a shot of Patron. Do you think we're not going to slap hands with the guy and start partying with that group? Good lord! Oh man, lord. it would be the best shut, thing. It would be the best. Shut night. your goddamn mouth! De- you would de- <laughs> and we would walk. It's, for John, it's just him going down to the bar. For us, it would turn into the best night of our lives. Exactly. You know, we, we, we party with a exactly. light heavyweight champ all, yeah. all night. Yeah. The, the, it, seeing, the yeah. seeing Vandalay at fucking uh, oh. Las, <laughs> Las Vegas airport story would take a huge backseat yeah, oh, to doing would. shots of Patron with fucking yeah. John Jones in uh, Manhattan Beach. Just just like so. in a fight, if, uh, if if it was John versus Vandalay, he'd beat him. And uh, even in if he hands me a shot of Patron, that would beat poor old Vandalay too. That was still and as and that was one of the best like moments of uh, of a life for me in terms of like humans that you get to meet. The axe murder of Vandalay Silva that that was just great. <laughs> yeah. Did but you see – you saw 205 when you were over there? I did. I you did. did? Yeah. Danny's always been a Connor fan. We've heard him talking about him on pre- like previous podcasts. And I, I think I said on the two, UFC 205 uh, review on the last potty where I'm on board now, man. I, I, I fully get it and shit. I'm a believer just like you are now. What a performance. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think uh, – yeah, it's it's like uh, I mean, it's not a case of being a believer. I don't really think like his his skill set has been laid completely out on the table at this point. I feel like, and we know the formula that like would expose his weaknesses. And uh, and Eddie Alvarez wasn't that man. No, and we know that he's got absolute brick fists. And if you uh, even somewhat sort of around his size, you're going to feel those. Nate Diaz is is a fair bit fucking bigger than him, and he felt him. Very he fair. felt him fucking for sure. But dropped three times. Yeah. yeah. He can take the shots. Him and his brother can take the shots. Yeah. Nate and Nick can both eat it. And uh, it just it, the precision of it, man, he yeah. just, it was a masterclass. It really yeah. was, wasn't it? It was, it was fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, so he's ta- he's taking a bit of time away now, and and shit's happening. But yeah, that uh, was that was interesting. That um that that baby announcement. Mm. Um, yeah, there's all he, sorts uh, of shit around that, wasn't there? Yeah, there was, there was, and um, it definitely didn't sound like. I mean, obviously, you know, we're talking about martial arts, which is which is got to be one of the most selfish sports that there is. I mean, you have to be so focused on your obsessed with yourself, like all the time, yep. and like. When he was questioned on his on his child, who presumably is like girlfriend or whoever's having the child, is a fair ways away mm. through the pregnancy. She'd be the best part of like he six, didn't seem 16 to have weeks. a fucking clue of when it was due no. or like absolutely anything. And I mean, that, that was a man who had his nose to the grindstone. Yeah, yeah. that was my take on it. I, he he really had fucking no clue what he was doing. <laughs> no. He's like, I'm packing my dax about it. I really don't fucking know. Him. He went like, from like when is uh, it? When is it? March, May? Like, exactly. like he didn't he didn't even know and the y- month. And you know, he's got like 
he's known for being this crazy fucking media personality where he's got like a quip and a and a and a punchline mm. for every fucking thing that you can throw yep. at him. And all of a sudden yep. it just seemed like he was Stumped he went him. straight <laughs> straight back to Cage Warriors post fight yeah. interview like I'm here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, back to I, I don't fucking know man. Fucking uh, crap uh, me ducks yeah, about yeah, it to be honest. Right. Right. <laughs> oh man, McGregor like he's the he's by far the biggest star that they've ever had now. Yeah. And it just and, compl- and I've, completely and, and like out. yeah, you you say you know I'm I'm I've been on the train for a while and it's the same with John Jones like uh, I have no shame in admitting that I'm I'm for the I'm for the freak fight model and I'm for the the entertainment value to a certain extent of course like um I thought it, I thought it was shit the way that um that Mark Hunt got the end of the deal that Mark Hunt got when they brought Brock in in terms of a freak up. fight but I kind of you know like I've I've got friends who are martial artists and and you know will will debate the point with me about you know what is what is the true sort of like martial arts competition is it getting to know who's the best or is it just get is do we just want the biggest profiles or whoever's going to sell the biggest fights and I think you know my my argument towards that I suppose is that the UFC as it stands already is not a true reflection of martial arts you know martial arts is not about you know the the competition of things in front of a crowd it's mm-hmm. about all this sort of like self discipline and it's it's much deeper than that like not that i you know have have studied in depth in any martial arts but from you know what i understand of it the ufc is an in- entertainment right. sort of entity the, based on martial the arts the product model of the ufc now that it's owned by wme img the huge entertainment company it's more towards entertainment now than going down We're to your, little, that to, more, to your yeah. little local dojo at Sandgate. Bernie Hoy Karate. Michael <laughs> Michael Bisbing, uh, Dan Henson. Exactly, exactly right. It's one of those, it's vastly different now, just pure entertainment. But this week we're leading into 206. Yeah, so we lost um, the DC... Anthony Johnson Anthony rematch, Johnson fight off that. which which is a shame because uh, any any t- any time those two guys fight, you're going to watch it. Rumble cracked him in that first one and w- almost put him away. DC felt that power well and truly, but that that fight got scrapped. DC was out injured, so that's going to be rescheduled. Rumble's been offered a couple of fights, but hasn't accepted. He turned down Musasi. Nothing to gain out of fighting him at this point. He's got a title shot waiting for him. Yeah. Why fight a dangerous guy like Musasi yeah, who might happen to get up. him to the ground or something and might catch him in some shit? He's well-rounded, so why take that? Fully agree what Anthony Rumble's done and just waiting to reshape yeah. it. Fair so enough. what is the main of that um, 206 on The main now, it's been bumped up. This fight was on the main card scheduled for three rounds, but now it's been uh, set up for five rounds, which is ideal for this fight. It deserves three round, uh, five rounds rather than three. Anthony Pettis, Max Holloway for the interim 145-pound title. I like that. Great like fight. That. Great Max fight. Holloway comes to fucking bang. The last time Max Holloway lost a fight was Conor to McGregor. Yeah, He true. went three rounds with McGregor. McGregor yeah. hit him and he didn't put Max away <laughs> because Max is young. He fucked Conor's knee up, didn't he? Uh, yeah, there was a, McGregor did his ACL in that fight and fought on and managed to uh, win a decision. Yeah. And hit him on the feet and hit him with plenty of shots. But Max being youthful like he is, Max Holloway's only sort of 23 years old now. It would have yeah. been 20 when he, when he fought McGregor. Yeah. Uh, just a young guy with a Crazy good chin. Crazy, stringy Hawaiian dude. He is lanky. He's won nine he's fights since then. He gets his interim shot now against Pettis, an ex-155 champion who's now fighting down a weight class. Uh, and Anthony Showtime Pettis, everything about his nickname is accurate. He brings the fucking striking every time, but has subs as well. So this main event is going to be fucking lit. Mate, as as an aside, <laughs> though, what the fuck is going on with Anthony Pettis outside? Like, oh, this, Some shit happened in this guy's this personal shit. life, man. We're talking... Yeah, he lives in um, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, in the States. Wisconsin. Yeah, yeah. It's get, getting cold there yeah, now. Shit, yeah. Wakes up. He had a couple of these... Uh, that's Green Bay Packer territory out there, man. <laughs> and they have a um, bunch of snow there. He looks out... Had he's got a couple of his coaches in town to go train down at Rufus Sport, out at Duke Rufus' gym. Mm. Got a couple of trainers there. Looks out his window the first night that the trainers get to stay with him. He's got a uh, Land Rover and a couple of other sports cars just on fire in his driveway. A couple of gangbangers come and lit a bunch of his cars on fire. Says that he knew nothing about it, but these guys have apparently, and I've only heard this on a podcast today that he was talking about, these guys came back, tried to steal his replacement cars. Oh, these these just a couple of uh, 
gangbangers. Who knows if these guys are strangers to Tim or not? I, I, I don't know that, but uh, they're yeah. coming, coming back to fuck with him e- either way, and they're coming back to steal his fresh vehicles, and he's got <laughs> cameras installed at his house now, so they've got footage of these guys, and apparently they've been pinched. It sounds like some gangster shit, man. Yeah. And I, what's he doing parking them on the driveway anyway? Like, yeah, get, get, a, yeah, get a car hole, guy. <laughs> 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 what do you call it? <laughs> yeah, a car hole. That's two Simpson re- yeah, references. In one one after the one in the first half, one in the second half. <laughs> Beautiful. If it's like a 40-20 in NRL, it'd be rare, but it'll <laughs> pop up a, a, every now and then. But yeah, fucking... But that main event, I, I don't know I don't know who to pick in that fight, though. I, I'm, I think Max might be able to trouble him with his length. Pettis has to cut a lot of weight for five <laughs> rounds now. Trouble him with his yeah, length. Yeah, he really make Big Pettis time. bounce on his length and like, <laughs> he, he, he might tap out. <laughs> uh, oh, man. Imagine uh, if they just broke out into that. They'd cut it, like the footage. At, yeah. what, at what point would it they w- cut it? It might be the end of the sport, man. Probably. It might be. Yeah, uh, but no, no, we're shut down now. Look, this is human cockfighting as it is. Like a bunch of like people coming <laughs> out saying that. Like there's protesters about that saying, like, look, humans fighting in a cage. It's a, yeah. it's a bloodbath and, th- and yeah. things like this. But to me, it's just a sport as well. And it's more turning into an entertainment product, like yeah. you're saying. But yeah. I don't know. Uh, th- on, on that card as well, a couple of good fights too. Fucking Kelvin Gastelum having to go up against Tim Kennedy now in a rescheduled fight. Remember he missed weight to is fight Donald? Fu- is he going to fucking make weight? That shit me about so this Kelvin. this is at middleweight now. It is. That's at 185 now. So Kelvin... Okay. So he, surely he, he, he will should make, be able to make that. He will make that. But uh, I'm pulling for Tim Kennedy to beat him down, man. He uh, he robbed Cowboy of his moment at that uh, at that card, man. He, he yeah. If, yeah. If you guys didn't see it, Kelvin Gastelum missed weight to fight at Madison Square Garden for the after, first time. After how many times has Kelvin Gastelum missed yeah, weight? Yeah, that's right. He won the Ultimate Fighter at eight, 185. He's down to 170 now, and he's missed it probably three or four times there now. Yeah. And they've cut guys for worse than that. It should, and, Yeah, uh, it should be a case of, you know, he's not allowed to fight 170 anymore. You you mm, missed Dana weight three times. Dana like, has said no, that. No, that's, that's done. I've heard from his corner that he's adamant that he's fighting at 85 here and going back to 70, but this guy just hasn't done it. I mean... Rumble Johnson, one of my favourite fighters, missed weight a couple of times and got cut a few years ago. Just that reaction from Dana, like cost mm. him a main event sort of thing. Did so Rumble get down to welterweight at one point? He, he started in the UFC at 170, where Fuck. he can walk around as big now at 250. So he was uh, he, his, his weight cuts basically Christ. killed that guy. That was like the is even worse some, than McGregor is going that to some 70. Mexican supplements getting him. To oh, that point I, I don't know. I, I really don't know with a guy Lorenz, like Rumble. But Lorenz he, Larkin did a crazy r- weight range, didn't he? He, he was at one seventy and then and then got up to light heavy. Didn't I he? don't know. But we'll look, bit, we'll put it putting crazy fucking weight into into perspective. Uh, BJ Penn fought Leota Machida. BJ Penn was at two hundred five once and fought at middle fought, weight. fought Leota at two hundred five. At 205. Yeah, man. Be, uh, oh. In an open way, like where Leota, oh. I think it was 205 where those guys fought. And, That's uh, right. That's he lost right. A, BJ lost a decision to Leota, but went the distance with him and like, hung with him and shit. Fuck. So, BJ's got a. Uh, who's, who's BJ? had? A, he's got a fight lined up. Oh, he uh, had one well. cancelled in the he's, Philippines, right? He's had one cancelled, but he's got one lined up. Did they cancel that whole Philippines card? What? He's fighting Yair Rodriguez, BJ oh. Penn. But, uh, what, one for the week. We were talking about Cowboy and shit. We didn't get our picks for that, but. Cowboy versus Matt Brown is uh, is, is on that's 206. That's the co-main. Got to be a barn burner. That's, a, that's an absolute dog fight for three Brown rounds. Matt Brown coming off a loss yeah, or two? Yeah, he does. I think he is off two losses, Matt Brown, yeah. uh, at the but moment. But he's always brought it, man. He's, he's in every fight. Yeah. he's got, Yeah, he's a terror. He's hard to put away. I think Cowboy's going to kick him in the body and put him yeah. away. I'm going to go Donald. Matt Brown, for those who don't know, um, his nickname is The Immortal. And I was reading this big article on the Underground one time like a while back about the origin of a lot of fighters' nicknames. And apparently his friends call him the immortal because he was pronounced dead for um, 60 seconds or two minutes or something like that that after a heroin overdose and subsequently came back to have a... You know, professional athletic yeah. career, distinguished martial, martial arts, arts career. Yeah, yeah. One, and one of these guys that brings it every time too. He gets caught oh, up in these yeah. dog fights where, as you say, is the immortal. So he just bites down in his mouthpiece. He's and got a mortal going, tattooed but... across his stomach. Like, oh shit! Yeah. Well, um, we uh, we saw him at a at a fan event in um, Sydney, Sydney, mm. Sydney City, and um, he was. The biggest one fucking seventy I've ever fucking seen. Granted, Huge. he was wearing a big set of Tims and a and a flannel and some jeans, but he looked like 
he could beat the fuck out of you and six of your mates. Like, yeah, straight up. Yeah, come, come at Matt Brown. There's going to be big trouble there as well. The same day when we were there. Uh, you just sort of got an idea how big these guys walk around when they're not cutting weight. He looked uh, easily as big as Weidman because he, he was definitely there with yeah. Weidman, Weidman was day. fucking big as well, man. Yeah. I was very surprised at how big and tall Weidman was too. He's six, yeah. six two, every bit of probably like two fifteen, two twenty. The, the biggest you've ever had. Um, I've been with Yoel. <laughs> well. Yoel sunned him at that. Uh, you've at been that with guy. um. You've been with the Axe Murderer as well. Yeah, Vandalay. Yeah, he was very violent. Like the name suited. <laughs> He didn't get that nickname from his fighting career. How, how <laughs> thick was <laughs> how thick was Vandalay's neck? Big man. I remember walking walking into a uh, an airport news agency, and uh, he's standing over at the magazines like, with his back to me, wearing a Jaco brand backpack with polo shirt on. And you saw the tattoo on the saw neck. the saw the tat on the back of the head, instantly. back of the skull. I'm like, holy fuck, that can only be one dude. Uh, turned around, yeah, had a like said hello to him and stuff, but he was just a really, really thick fucking dude. Yeah. Like his head just looked so tough, but wearing his sunnies inside as well, big <laughs> pair of like brown aviators. And you were like, uh, "You gonna fucking, you gonna fuck Chad?" Yeah, that, there's a lot of beef with him. I'm and gonna Chael beat Sonny. his ass, yeah, man. I'll beat his ass, bro. <laughs> and it, like, not that he's fucking from Brooklyn, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm not even gonna attempt to give him my Portuguese after a couple of captains. <laughs> Don't forget. <laughs> you know what was interesting though? Like uh, I caught a flight from um, from Medellin to Panama to uh, JFK. And um, I think it must have been the flight from Panama because Panama is kind of like a launching pad for a lot of Latin America to get to the Europe, Europe's and, and you mm-hmm. know, US, US places. And, um, and uh, through like I have fucking zero Portuguese whatsoever. Like... There's a few words that are the same in Spanish as they are in Portuguese. Like, I think they say por favor as well for please. Bom dia. <laughs> That's good morning. Good morning. Okay. Bom dia. I only know because my uh, older brother had a uh, Portuguese girl over a couple of times. Uh, and uh, okay. Just through, like, the social media apps and that, like, dating apps. And um, <laughs> she was really, really nice girl. I had really good English. He but had been on, on Tinder and picked yeah, up a Brazilian girl. Yeah. Bird. Yeah. Okay. That's it. And... Um, I remember she mixed these cocktails up one night, had uh, four cocktails, like partner and I, Tim, and the, uh, I can't even remember what her name was. For the sake of the story, we'll call her Teresa. <laughs> she, Teresa? Yeah, Teresa, girl. <laughs> but she was, uh, made you four, going made out in that, girl? Four, you made put four some cocktails. fucking clothes on, it? Teresa. Oh, man, big. She was, had the, Your daddy had come the Latin home body. see you like that? Latin body, too. <laughs> Yeah, Man, that's probably what they're yelling at you in the streets in like the Latin American. <laughs> that's nice. I had a dude scream at me in um in Italian. He started like shouting some shit at me in Italian one day, and and like Gringo was part of it or whatever. Yeah. I was like, does this guy think I'm Italian, or is this an insult, or yeah. you just don't understand because you no. don't understand the language if somebody's shouting something. Like, Hi, mate. In a hostile <laughs> manner at you, so like all I basically do is I'm like, Buenos noches, señor. Like I say like. Good morning, sir. In yeah. a in a stern sort of like yeah. looking him in the eye manner, yeah, sort of thing. Yeah. Like that's all you can really do. That's like because I feel like you're taking the piss, but I don't really know. So, good day to you, sir. Like, yeah, yeah. That's that's about all all you can do. Just keep it on the level at that yeah. point. Yeah. It's like it's, no, this this fucking dude's mad dogging me, man. Yeah. <laughs> Let me at him, son. This guy want to get <laughs> fucked up? Like oh man. McCarran- Just like. One punch coward styles, like from an Aussie pub, not having a clue that like how many people are strapped with knives and guns, and you know got nothing to lose in the Latin yeah. Latin streets. Did you see the uh, coward puncher, the bouncer that I sent you on, um, man, online for for the <laughs> listeners at home? Uh, Kyle Stephen, who's been <laughs> who's <laughs> been a guest on our on our podcast several times, he's he's quite the regular, has been tagging. Me and Bristles and a, and a few of our, our close circle in some pretty extreme videos on Instagram and actually sending me some uh, Snapchats of videos on YouTube of, like, people getting shot in the head and, like, extremely, like, KO'd in, in there, big, yeah. like, sort of soccer ball kicks to the heads and stuff <laughs> like that. Like, there is some violent, like, crazy videos on the internet. I think you tagged me in one today where... um. There were two, this this must be like middle America somewhere, like two white 
middle-aged women in the cosmetics aisle of a grocery store. Yeah, Walmart. Proper, proper cat fight, like smashing each other in, in front the, of her son in the face, pulling hair, and one one of the women has her son there, and she's calling out to him at the start of the cat fight, punch her in the fucking head, Billy, punch her in the fucking head, and then the kid is like, you can see whoever's filming this from the side of the aisle is sort of like going from the fight to the kid's reaction to the fight mm. to the kid's reaction, and the kid is just so bewildered and confused and at one point he he tries to like hit the woman that's beating the shit out of his mum in in the grocery store and it's just like with a shampoo bottle oh they're God. in the shampoo aisle of this uh like pharmacy drugstore what they'd call over there or yeah cosmetics and then they um poor kids just doesn't have a chance man just doesn't have a chance you need to have your shit together a lot more than that it's um it it's crazy when you like you know nowadays with the internet you have this little window into this crazy fucking world and 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 you know life is made up of all these tiny little moments all these different thi- little things happening to you in your everyday life and happening to everybody at the same time like whilst you and I sit here and do this podcast right now it's you know Fucking 6 a.m. in the morning in Medellin, Colombia, and somebody just got killed. Or, like, you know, it's it's fucking New York City, like, 9 a.m., and somebody Someone, somebody's yeah. having a bagel or, or whatever. Yeah. Like, Someone's there's getting extorted. This, this crazy surging mass of experience is just happening, like, constantly. And fucking the internet gives us this, this oh. unique little window into these tiny little slices of life and... Life is fucking extreme, man. We live in a bubble here in Australia, but when you when you branch out of that bubble or, you know, even if it's just through a little portal hole in, in the internet, like through your laptop, you see this shit, you're just like, fuck, man. Through laptop. Have you, have you seen the uh, Geelong train station X-rated video? No, is this, is this in the last month as well? Like this week. Right. There's I've had no yeah. Australian media over the last six weeks, so... Uh, Other than the knockoff podcast, some yeah, I'd see you listen to those throwbacks, <laughs> <laughs> throwbacks, and and to uh, two fairly substantial fucking potties with uh, with poor sound quality. Yeah, that's it. Going back apologies, to the laptop. Apologies, man. fam, but uh, went, went back to episode one, man. We might yeah. as well have been on the iPhone. It's all G, son. The content is there. Yeah, that's it. We still fucking try to keep it going, but how good is this sound though? <laughs> <laughs> the, Straight mic. The, there was. Talking about things that are rife on the internet at this train station in the Geelong region in Melbourne, a prominent Instagram female graffiti artist has filmed a sex tape with a bloke at a train station just in absolute public. With herself. With all the lights on, with another guy. Herself. Her, uh, she's having. She's fucking some other dude on it, this video? On film with someone filming them. At prob- it has to be in the wee small hours of the morning because there's no one around. And they wow. get away with an eight eight and a half minute sex tape. Wow! At this uh, on this so train it's at station. a train station on the platform. Mm. Is it in front of her tag or something like that? Uh, she was going to put some graph up at the start, but this guy interrupts her. Like they film the scene, she's like oh, about to put a tag up. He's shit. like, "Hey, what the fuck are you doing?" Goes in. They start having uh, oral sex, intercourse, all sorts of stuff oh. on, on, on this film. And the, What's her uh, name? Big, Shout out. No idea. No, I can't can't remember off the top of my head. This was a, a couple of nights ago where I read this article, but uh, it's straight up fucking ridiculous. That's um, that's like throwback to uh, South Bank. Oh, South Bank. There fun. was for 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 those of you listening who live in the in the Brisbane city or or greater regions area. In, uh, I want to say like 2003, something no, like no, that. No, no, it was way after that. Way after way that? Way after that, man. Way that would have been that. 2000. I felt like it was around about the invention of video phones. No, no way, man. I was, it was uh, a grainy ass no. Sony Ericsson it, footage. It no, wasn't. It'd be 2007 uh, or eight for sure, man. A- a- absolutely, because I know uh, I know the people that were sending it to me initially. But uh, this this thing was ridiculous. The, uh, another tape of in uh, Southbank Railway Station in Brisbane. There must Queensland be a thing with rail. yeah. There must be a thing with uh, people going to train stations for some gnarly shit. But it's crazy how people get themselves in some heated moment of lust where they're doing something on camera, which uh, is essentially never ever going to go away. 
because it'd be forever shared on any sort of tubing sites, things like that. With the the research of being of that news story, with typing a couple of keywords into Google, you get that video on your phone or your laptop or computer in it, as, as quickly as you want, and that yeah. will be around forever. So you've got to be fucking so careful with what you're thinking about putting out on these sort of social media apps and things like that. Oh, I bet she was, man. I mm. bet it was a conscious decision. If she if she like mapped out a whole scene mm. and she's a prominent like in quotes, fucking graffiti painter, graffiti yeah. artist on on um, Instagram. She's obviously gagging for those likes. She's gagging for those followers. Mm. She's living a different sort of lifestyle. She might be just going that Kim Kardashian business model one hundred and one. Just mm. like let me let me try and get famous here. Um, it's and, and you know, like like from your perspective, it's like you need to be careful with what you put on the fucking mm. internet. From her perspective, it's like I might get fucking rich and famous yeah, here. I'm about to blow up. Yeah, and it's like, and that's like only a, a small little slice of what we're talking about. The varying degrees of human mm. behavior that exist. There's, you know, there's us us doing this podcast here, and then there's you know. Sweet P doing the sex yeah. tape there, and then there's kicked in the face. People getting know. kicked <laughs> in the face, and then there's people getting shot in the face. It's like that's all happening right now, right at this mm. very moment. All of that shit is just like bang, bang, like this fuck, fucking fireworks going off everywhere. Like life is crazy, man. Shit's fucking <laughs> wild. That's why. That's why we we can only focus on so much, and that's why we focus on our fucking shitty job or our, you know, why we're not sleeping enough or all of these like little microscopic problems that help us help us rationalize life that's because it. life is too immense for us to get our mm. head around like, that's it man that status yeah. quo of road yeah. of least resistance <laughs> 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 you know what i mean yeah. back to those creature comforts and things like that man it can be uh well and truly fucking a way to get by <laughs> absolutely man life life is fucking crazy life is crazy you got to pull it all down that's pull it. it all down and just uh Watch MMA. Watch two two dudes try and fight to the death. Like uh, you know, do whatever do whatever fucking gets your rocks off. Definitely. Want to uh, before we wrap it, I want to uh, finish on MMA. Like Danny just mentioned our boy Justin from uh, previous episode one and oh. my man. Mixed martial my arts man. career is is off the mark. He had a win at Eternal MMA twenty two. I think the next uh, would definitely keen to get him on and talk the listeners through his whole uh, fight week experience leading Absolutely, up to it, the yeah. fight itself. He won't be far away. Good to have you back, Danny. Thanks really, a lot, man. Enjoyed this one. We've had a, uh, we've sampled some fine ale. <laughs> uh, broke, a broke bit it of that down. Los Angeles Captain Morgan's. That's it. Little Was it $17? $17 US, fam. For a, what, a litre and a half? Oh, I think it's more. I think it's like 2.2 or something. It's like a ridiculously giant bottle. Jeez. Costco, shout out. Sponsor of the podcast, Walmart, Costco. Shout out to Alpha Brain too. We had uh, Chris Chris <laughs> holler out about the uh, how good the Alpha Brain was today. Chris, uh, our, our absentee knockoff member, is uh, basically funding every single overseas trip that Aubrey Marcus has ever done. Oh, he's yeah. bought Shroom Tech. He's yeah. bought Alpha Brain. He's bought whatever back scratcher uh, that the protein uh, powder <laughs> the protein powder <laughs> yeah uh Aubrey saw Chris coming from a mile away just like Dolce oh no, yeah <laughs> so, so, saw Dolce with that three binder fucking book uh, that's grinded Chris's goat Chris is uh, coming back we talked about Justin's card and how he got the win and full congrats to him we'll break it down soon but Chris might have to uh, <laughs> throw the organisation under the bus last time. We got a bit stitched up. Chris has got to be in his bonnet about the uh, <laughs> about the coverage of the event, but um, but yeah, shout out Eternal, <laughs> you're uh, you're doing your thing. It um, looking after fr- our boy. From what I saw, and and legit, what I saw was um, was Snapchats from my from my buddies and shit like that. Not of any of the action, just of uh, the walkout and the decision, and um, which was obviously the best part for Jay Berg. Oh yeah, straight up. But um, but yeah, the production looked fucking mean, man. Like it was, um, you know, they followed a lot of the same model, obviously, as the UFC, and it looked yeah, super, have to, yeah. super professional. And they, you uh, know. they got it down. He'll he'll be here shortly. But um, yeah, so while Chris isn't here, we'll throw him under the bus, and uh, that's what you get for not being here. So yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fam. As usual, it's been a pleasure. Be good to each other and uh, we'll see you soon. Bye for now. Kisses.